expired. The Senate will now consider the proposal from Senator Roberts, which is also shown at item 12 on today's order of business. Is the proposal supported? It is indeed supported. With the concurrence of the Senate, the clerks will set the clock in line with the informal arrangements made by the whips, and I call Senator Roberts. Thank you. As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia who listens to constituents, I know life is getting worse for you and this government doesn't care. Australia has entered a per capita recession. The total GDP is still going up on paper. Technically, the government can say that we aren't in a technical recession. Yet on average, the gross domestic product per Australian went backwards. That's a per capita recession. You're not imagining it. Life is getting far, far worse on average for the entire country. This isn't news to anyone who's recently paid a grocery docket or a power bill or tuned in to hear Philip Lowe whether or not the Reserve Bank are going to make their lives even harder this month. It's news to the Albanese government, though, because they're more interested in telling everyone to vote for the voice than doing something to fix the cost of living. The Australian Bureau of Statistics has, co has confirmed what we already knew. On average, life is only getting tougher, far tougher for Australians. The major cause of Australia's per capita recession is the, is the UN 2050 net zero policies that are putting a chokehold on our country. This fact is one of many that exposes the lie that wind and solar are the cheapest source of electricity. With more wind, solar and batteries on the grid than ever in history, power prices have never been higher. This is mirrored around the world in countries adopting solar and wind. The record expensive power bills bite one, more than once, not only when Australians hand over more money than ever to their electricity and gas company. Power prices feed into nearly every level, every part of our lives. Without cheap power, manufacturers can't produce the products we want and need at a reasonable price. Farmers can't afford to pump the water that irrigates crops and keeps cattle alive. Shops can't afford to keep the lights on and the doors open. So you don't just pay the price of the climate net zero pipe dream once on your power bill, you pay it for again and again and again in every other bill as well. It's irrefutable. Life is getting worse for Australians and you're all having to make tougher and tougher choices around the dinner table. There's never been more proof that Australians can't afford the UN 2050 net zero pipe dream. This is leading to huge cracks in our economy. Everyday businesses are becoming insolvent. The trend for retail spending, usually a good indicator of whether households are feeling the pinch, is negative. The average cost of housing as a portion of disposable income is at 20.1 per cent, up from almost 16.5 per cent only a few years ago. The lowest fifth of earners who hold a mortgage are spending on average nearly two-thirds of their disposable income on the loan. Two-thirds of their disposable income on a house loan. All this means that in real terms our economy is getting worse for Australians, yet that isn't showing up yet in the total GDP, which records the amount of activity in the economy. This is where the government is using their favourite Ponzi scheme, mass immigration to cover up the cracks. Listen carefully. When you let more immigrants into the country, they have to spend money on the same things we all have to, like food, housing, transport, energy. All of this spending counts towards total gross domestic product. If the total gross domestic product goes down, we enter a, a recession, which is an embarrassing look for the government. So it's a pretty simple equation for the Albanese government. More immigrants equals more spending, which equals the total gross domestic product going up. And the government can say we're not in an official recession. That's why they're doing it and bugger the cost to individuals. At the same time, life continues to get worse for Australians. Smaller amounts of gross domestic product growth and our limited housing services have to be shared with hundreds of thousands of new immigrants. That's the per capita recession. With more people, demand increases and prices increase even more. The Albanese government expects to increase our net immigration to 715,000 people over two years. That's the size of the entire Gold Coast Tweed Heads area, or one and a half Canberra's arriving in just two years. Every arrival will need a bed. Every arrival will need a roof over their head. Where does the Albanese government expect them to live? To which one of our overfilled schools will children go? To which overflowing hospital will they go when, get, when they get sick? The Albanese government doesn't care about the answer to these questions as long as they can say, we're not in a technical recession. Bugger the cost of people, their lives. The solutions to the cost of living crisis are clear. They'll just take some guts and some honesty, abandon unaffordable climate 
UN 2050 net zero pipe dreams and cut net immigration to zero until our essential services and housing catch up. Here, here. Senator Mariel Smith. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I also rise to speak on this matter of public importance. And there's a lot of ground to cover, but I will start with some economic context to the Senator's remarks just made. It is not uncommon for quarter to quarter for the per capita measure to move in this direction. In fact, it's gone backwards one in every four quarters since these records began some 50 years ago. So for context, that's about 48 times out of the past 199 quarters. So we need to keep that in context. But of course, there is no doubt that we are seeing the impact of higher interest rates, high but moderating inflation and global uncertainty. These things are absolutely hitting households across Australia, households in my state of South Australia and our economy. And at the same time, we have a rebound in population growth, driven by the reopening of our economy and the return of international students in particular. But I believe that's a good thing. It's showing up in stronger service exports, and that's good for both the education and tourism sectors in Australia. It's good in my state of South Australia. But while the students are coming back, and given the impact of the pandemic on, on those student numbers and those movements, that's a good thing that they're coming back. We also know that net overseas migration won't catch up to the coalition forecast levels until the end of the decade. So context is important in this debate. Facts in numbers are important in these debates. And in terms of the implied context of this matter of public importance put by Senator Roberts, that's that net zero is causing the sky to fall in, that is simply not true. Because despite what Senator Roberts has said, the net zero transformation is a defining economic opportunity for our country. It is a defining economic opportunity for my home state of South Australia. With our abundance of natural resources, we as a nation have the potential to be a renewable energy superpower, and there are opportunities for us in that. As a nation, there are opportunities for our children in that. The government is absolutely committed to ensuring that we do not miss out on that potential and that opportunity, and we're working towards ensuring we have the policy settings to enable us to benefit from the economic revolution that being a part of net zero offers, that taking serious action on climate change offers our nation. Because for a decade, we had a government on these benches which was facing its own existential crisis about whether climate change actually existed, whether climate crisis on our doorstep was a real thing or not. We had them oversee 22 energy policies and fail to land one. We saw their internal battles and leadership tensions get in the way of delivering sensible climate policy. Indeed, for more than a decade, they defined themselves by being wreckers on climate action, wreckers on energy policy, ignoring the science and diving headfirst into the sand, pretending the climate crisis doesn't exist. And because of that, we missed out on a decade of progress and work, and we're on to fixing it. Our government is on to fixing it, because our government sees climate action as not just necessary in terms of the future of our planet, not just necessary in terms of preserving a future for our children and grandchildren, but there are economic opportunities in it. There is economic potential. There's economic potential in my home state of South Australia. In our May budget, we included an additional $4 billion to help get our transition into renewable energy moving, taking the total investment under our government to more than $40 billion. Investing in renewables isn't just good for the future of the planet. It's good for Australia's regions. It's good in South Australia. Towns like Wyala, where the potential of a world-leading hydrogen power plant will not only provide energy for future generations in our state, but economic opportunity as well. Australians want to see action on climate change. They didn't spend the last 10 years having an internal debate about whether it was real. They didn't spend the last 10 years torn up in knots about it. Every South Australian I speak to says, well, this is science, this is fact, this is coming down the line. But for a decade, 
we had a government which refused to engage, which couldn't land one of 22 energy policies. There are economic opportunities here. The sky's not falling in. The economic potential is huge for South Australia and for our country. Senator Canavan. Deputy President. Well, I know the Prime Minister hasn't been to a petrol station re recently. He doesn't seem to know uh, the price of petrol, but, but I have, I have, and in recent months I know many of Australians have had. And they would have seen that uh, diesel often now is at $2.30 a litre. Uh, how is it that everything seems to have gone up in price since we committed to this crazy, crazy idea of net zero? Well, the fundamental fact here is if you commit to something like net zero, you're not going to drill for oil. You're not going to increase the production of oil and gas, and so that thing, that thing being able to fill up at the petrol pump, pump is going to go up in price just as it has. Now, there are some people that haven't been silly enough to sign up to this agenda, or at least not doing anything to get, get close to it. And countries in the Middle East, like Saudi Arabia, uh, Russia, they're not doing anything to get near it. And so they are still drilling for oil and gas. And thanks to our stupid decisions here in Western countries, we have given them a blank cheque to determine the price of oil, determine the price of energy uh, across the whole world. And that is why you're seeing your petrol prices go up, because uh, Saudi Arabia and Russia are restricting supply at the moment. Uh, Brent crude oil prices have gone back over $90 for the first time uh, since the, the height of the Ukraine war. Uh, that is happening because we are not taking the decision in the free world uh, to produce our own energy resources, and therefore we're dependent for our basic energy needs on dictatorial and authoritarian regimes. That is what is happening. And the price of energy then influences the price of almost everything, because energy is what pretty much makes everything. Uh, the one thing I'd love people who advocate for net zero to say in this debate, I'd like someone, someone, just to map out some basic things about how we're going to do things in a net zero world. Take, for example, the, uh, the, the, the manufacturing of something called urea. Urea is a fertiliser that comes from natural gas. It is responsible for feeding half the world's population. Half the world's food comes from the fertilisers made from urea. Now, it is made from natural gas. How are we going to make, u make urea? How are we going to grow food for half the world's population if we have net zero and we don't have gas? I mean, it's very easy to say net zero. It's very easy to say, look, let's just have net zero emissions. It, it's, it's easy, isn't it? Well, it's not, because almost everything we grow, we make, we do in our society relies on the use of fossil fuels. And without them, without them, people will starve. Without fossil fuels, we won't be able to go anywhere. Without fossil fuels, uh, people will not have, a lot of people will not have jobs. And so just, answer, just answering those basic questions would be really, really helpful. Another thing you might notice is when you go down the shops now, things are a lot more in price. Obviously, everything's going up in price. But if you want to have a look, if you really look closely, those food items that require a lot of energy have gone up further in price. So things like milk and cheese, some forms of processed meat, have all gone up further in price because, I mean, cheese, how, how expensive is cheese these days? It's, it's unbelievable. Again, the Prime Minister probably doesn't realise, but I certainly see it when I'm buying making some hamburgers for the kids and buying the, the cheese slices. It's ridiculously expensive. Why? Because those products require a lot of energy. It's a large manufacturing process, a lot of refrigeration uh, to, to, to produce dairy products. And so they're going up in price. This is, this is the most crazy policy that any governments have ever adopted. We want to fundamentally change how we make, grow and travel within a generation. 2050, which is what they want to do net zero emissions by, is just 27 years away. And what's happened since the world is, well, like, we're trying to restrict our emissions and push up our costs, but it only really matters, of course, what we do here if other countries do the same, if the rest of the world acts as well. But what's happened since, since the world signed up to net zero emissions at Glasgow in late 2021? What's happened there since then? Global carbon emissions have gone up. They've gone up, not down. Now, ours haven't. We're, we're trying to do the right, well, so called right thing. But China, India, uh, Russia, as I've already mentioned, they're just laughing all the way to the bank. And that's why, oh, fundamentally, net zero emissions is a fraud and a scam, it is a total fraudulent scam which allows countries like China and, in and India and Russia, who don't play by the rules in the world game, it allows them to get off scot-free 
and then take the jobs from Western countries. This is a massive transfer of wealth and prosperity from our nations, from our country, from our people uh, to those countries who never and will not play by the rules. We are absolute mugs to fall for this scam, but we're doing it time and time again. Now, eventually it will end in tears because they won't be able to reach net zero emissions. And what is going to happen then? People will be very, very angry. Yeah. Senator Babette. Thank you. I rise here obviously today to support Senator Roberts' matter of public importance. Of course, I do. Now, the Labor government, they came to power promising Australians that they had a plan. They had a plan, all right. They had a plan to address the cost of living. They had a plan to lower the, the cost of power. They had a plan to boost productivity. But after almost 18 months in office, it is now clearly evident to every single Australian out there that the government didn't have a credible plan at all, unfortunately. I wish they did. Now, growth is up slightly, but inflation is higher, inflation is higher, and our dollar it just doesn't go as far as it should. Now, they have managed to create a one step forward but two steps backwards economy where people are becoming poorer despite the rhetoric of economic growth. Now, the growth itself is not keeping pace with the huge increase in immigration which has been authorised by this government. 1.5 million new migrants in five years. You know what that sounds like? It's a Ponzi scheme. It's a pyramid scheme. That's what it is. We are in a per capita recession. Now, there are some watching this broadcast right now that might not understand or even care to understand what a per capita recession is, but they understand what an unaffordable power bill is. They understand what 300 bucks a week or worse on a grocery bill is. They understand what $1,100 or more extra per month on a mortgage is. And they understand what paying more than half of their income on rent is and what it feels like. Now, having stumbled, stumbled into office with 32.6 per cent of the vote, our Prime Minister and Treasurer are now hiding their ineptitude behind a surge of new arrivals, hoping that these new immigrants will disguise our persistent and underlying economic problems. Talk about adding fuel to a fire. That's what that is. Not only does a surge in immigration fail to fix our economy, but the surge creates brand new economic problems in the form of increased pressures on health, housing, education, transportation, etc. Now, we have Minister Bowen spending billions rewiring the electricity grid to fit his obsession with net zero. We have Minister Burke rewriting industry agreements in his obsession with industrial relations. We have Treasurer Chalmers, Treasurer Chalmers whose main contribution to the Australian economy is a 6,000-word essay on reimagining capitalism. Even if he reimagines our nation, even as I should say, even as he reimagines our nation into a per capita recession, unfortunately for us. And we have our Prime Minister. What's he doing? What's our Prime Minister doing? He is obsessively distracted with a divisive constitutional change that half the country or more doesn't even want. That's what he's doing. Now, for the sake of all Australians, I urge the government to stop fiddling while this nation burns. Stop propping up the economy with international arrivals. Manage the economy with a coherent, economically responsible plan. Now, if you want to encourage economic growth, we need the government to be truthful with the Australian people. We all know that our electricity grid is a house of cards and net zero it is a pipe dream. The wind and solar racket has ensured that Australia is more dependent on China because that is where most of the solar panels come from. They also control most of the world's cobalt mines as well, a key mineral used in solar and wind and batteries, etc. So we send our coal and the other minerals to China. They use our cheap coal to process these minerals and then they send us back some solar panels and everything else with a hefty profit margin. These panels obviously got to be thrown out every two decades or so, roughly. There's another Ponzi scheme for you. There's another pyramid scheme for you there. Now, the government, the government must consider nuclear as an option. It must. It is safe. 
economically viable and has been very effective in comparable nations like Canada and the United States. Without cheap, reliable energy, our nation will continue to go backwards. The government needs to focus on one thing only, and that's just getting out of the way. It is time to reform our nation, repeal some legislation, reduce tax, reduce red and green tape, and put our trust in the Australian people and in the free market to get to work. Now, the way to correct our economic course is actually very simple. And I'll tell you this, it's just this, less government, more freedom. Yeah. Senator Dean Smith. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy uh, President. I rise to also speak this afternoon on this MPI. It was noted by one Labor senator that there's an economic revolution taking place in Australia, and I couldn't agree with her more. And that economic revolution is turning the lives of Australian families upside down. And like any revolution, it is causing chaos and heartache, and people can't see in front of them. And of course, that economic revolution is a cost of living crisis that is sparing no one in the Australian economy. Just last week, we saw the national accounts uh, delivered, provided, and as other senators have said, uh, it identified a per capita recession. A per capita recession is occurring across this country, meaning that Australians are getting poorer, are get a, getting poorer. And I think for the first time ever, Australian parents and Australian grandparents cannot say to their grandchildren that the future will be better for them than it has been for themselves. Because on the current trajectory, the only outcome that people can be confident of is one of falling living standards. Falling living standards. At the moment, in my home state of Western Australia, we know that WA has the largest number of mortgage borrowers in arrears of any Australian state. We also know that 21 per cent of West Australian respondents to a recent Salvation Army report said that they can no longer meet their mortgage and rental payments. 21 per cent of West Australians responding to the Salvation Army survey. And guess what that statistic is nationally? just 7 per cent, and 41,000 low-income mortgage holders in Western Australia are facing very severe mortgage stress with more than 30 per cent of the household budgets of those 41,000 families now being spent on mortgages. That is harm, that is hurt, that is striking in the hearts of many, many West Australian households. And we have a situation where the government couldn't care enough, couldn't care, not interested enough in the priorities of Western Australian working families. And it's all the more remarkable, all the more remarkable that the Prime Minister, Anthony Albanese, came to Western Australia in May last year and launched his federal campaign to become the Prime Minister of this country with the commitment, with a promise that he would make life cheaper for WA and Australian families. Nothing could be more serious from the truth. But there's something else that is happening in our country just at the moment, and it's happening quite subtly, and that is the government is seeking to undermine one of the most important consensus arrangements we have in our country. And that consensus is the high level of community support for our immigration program. Australia is a great multicultural country. And with multiculturalism brings a lot of additional benefits. But by bringing 715,000 people to Australia in just two years, at a time when we have a housing affordability crisis, at a time when rents are going through the uh, are skyrocketing, and we know that inflation is persistent in the rental market, that decision alone will go a long way to undermine public confidence in our very, very important immigration program. And the RBA has made that point. The RBA has made that point. The RBA said in its recent statement of monetary policy released earlier this year that a shortfall in housing supply 
relative to strong demand from a rising population is expected to result in continued upward pressure on rents, adding to the inflation forecast. An immigration program must be planned and it must be prepared for. And this government has not planned, has not prepared for a 715,000 increase over two years. And we know that that population burden falls disproportionately across our country. It falls in Sydney, it falls in Melbourne, and less so then in Perth and Brisbane. But maintaining high levels of public confidence in our migration program is so, so critical, and the government is on the verge Order. of trashing that. Senator Rennick. Thank you, <coughs> Acting Deputy uh, President. And uh, I'm very pleased to speak to this matter of public importance, and I think it really uh, gets to the heart and the crux of everything that is wrong with the Labor Party. Australia has moved into a per capita recession caused by net zero policies and is now resorting to an immigration and student Ponzi scheme to try and cover the damage. Well, it isn't working. It isn't working. But the damage, of course, is to the little guy, the battlers. And of course, the people who benefit from this is the Bingander town, and in particular the corporations in Australia who have more customers and therefore more revenue, and of course our universities, which are a breeding ground for the Marxists that end up joining the Labor Party and the Greens. And that is why the, the Labor Party continues on this reckless policy of having high immigration, uh, mostly by students. Now, I'm not against immigration. Indeed, it was uh, Ben Chiefly after the war, the former Prime Minister, who used immigration to build the Snowy Hydro uh, Mountain Scheme. Uh, and of course, that provided lots of uh, water and energy and also water for irrigation uh, down in some of the very fertile uh, food basins of northern Victoria and southern New South Wales. That's good immigration because it increases the supply of goods and services. But the problem with student uh, immigrants is the fact that they don't go out and work in productive uh, industries where they're building dams, they're building infrastructure. They're increasing the supply of water. They're increasing the supply of electricity. No, 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 no. They're sitting around, and as all students do, and I was a student once, and yes, I you know, wasted a lot of time drinking beer and all that, even though I did go and get a job while I was a student. Um, but this is not productive uh, labour, and so therefore all that the students do is increase demand while they don't increase supply. And of course, what we're seeing here is with, in this increasing demand is increasing interest rates, increasing uh, rentals, uh, rental, uh, the price of rents. Uh, we have a housing, that's if you can get a place to rent, because we've also got a housing shortage. Okay, then that, and it's not just about housing that you're putting the demand on here, you're putting it on all of our essential services, all of our essential services. So we need more uh, roads, we need more infrastructure, we need more hospitals, we need more schools, uh, and so on and so on. But of course, Labor sold out the little end of town because they know that they they are really in big uh, in bed with big business, big business. And we saw that last week with Qantas, uh, how the Prime Minister is uh, you know good mates with Alan Joyce, Mister, give me ten million dollars, even though I've, I've driven Qantas into the ground, Joyce. Uh, and of course, in bed with the universities. And of course, as we know, under Section 51 of the 1997 Income Tax Act. Universities don't have to pay tax on foreign students. Okay, and the reason why the Labor Party doesn't want to bring in a tax on universities is that universities are in their back pocket. In the same way they use superannuation funds to steal from the workers their super their hard earned superannuation the hard earned wages, they use universities to brainwash our children. So that by the time our children have started work, they're not only broke from Hexdeck that was brought in by Paul Keating uh, in the late 80s, they're brainwashed as well. They're brainwashed as well. You know, and of course, the real tragedy in all this uh, rapid immigration is our environment. Yet again, another act of hypocrisy here from the Labor Party, who pretend to care about the environment, and at the same time they're bringing in renewables, which is driving up energy prices. They have these horrendous housing developments on the edge of the cities, where they're putting these housing lots on top of each other and it's destroying some of our most productive agricultural land. 
It's destroying some of our most productive agricultural land. Uh, and you know, in the inner city areas, we're getting these ugly high rises. It's destroying the Australian way of life. Uh, and this is a real problem. This is a real problem. And the thing about it is, we have been, you know, Labor government now has been in power for almost 18 months, and they have not got any answers. All they have done is pour fuel on the fire of issues that were raised, you know, many times before. We need a much more productive uh, immigration. If we're going to have immigration, not against immigration, but it's got to be productive. And what Labor Party is doing is bringing, uh, running a rate of immigration that is way too high. They think it's going to cover up. You know, it's a short-term solution to say, "Oh, look, we're growing GDP." But the reality is, is that the GDP per capita is actually decreasing. And all I can say is, is that the Prime Minister is a one-trick pony that for the last 18 months has pushed the voice and he's going to find out very soon the people are going to realise that's all he can do. The time for the discussion has expired.